In this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about some opportunities and obstacles for precision phosphorus management. I'm Josh McGrath. I'm the Soil Extension Specialist from the University of Kentucky here in Lexington. And you can follow me on Twitter at NPK underscore professor. So when we talk about uh, the four R's in nutrient management, the right rate at the right place at the right time from the right source, oftentimes we forget to talk about performance objectives. You know, what defines right? And so we have competing performance objectives. The right rate to maximize yield is not the same as the rate that maximizes uh, economic return, and it's not the same as the rate that you know, is most environmental protective. So how do we balance these trade-offs where max yield doesn't equal max profit, and max profit doesn't equal the environmental optimum? And we know that the most profitable system will likely have some environmental impact, but we still want to balance these things. And I think Precision Ag offers us an opportunity to better balance and target nutrients. So site-specific or precision management kind of gives us this opportunity to target resources where we need them, we can maximize economic return, and we can try and minimize that environmental footprint. So about 40 to 70 percent of retailers report that they're doing some sort of variable rate nutrient strategy. And I, I read these statistics from surveys and I question what was the agronomic basis for their prescription that they came up with. Um, so what do we need? Let's break it down. To do precision ag variable rate in a field, we need some sort of high resolution characterization of the spatial variable nutrient need. Like in simple terms, a map of rates for that field. Where do we need to change rates going across the field? Typically we do this based on a map of nutrient availability based on soil testing. Grid point sampling is probably the most common way that we create prescription maps. We need, so we've got this soil test map, right, with just a bunch of numbers of what the concentration of, for example, malic 3 extractable phosphorus is across the field. But we have to interpret that number, take that soil test number, and equate it to a fertilizer rate. So we need an interpretation, and that interpretation has to have matching precision. We then need to take that interpretation and make a recommendation for the variable rate application. The interpretation and the recommendation are slightly different because the interpretation is what uh, the rate would maximize yield at that soil test, but the recommendation may not be the same. We might have other adjustments based on cropping system or philosophy. So let's talk about what we have to do variable rate. We can fertilize at a pretty fine resolution. The engineers have done a good job of giving us machinery to do variable rate. Unfortunately, I often, you know, kind of quote a friend of mine who says that uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we have this machinery that can do variable rate, so all of a sudden we start at going variable rate. And I think we're missing some of the other components because we can't precisely map need at the same resolution uh, that we can change the rate. And we don't develop recommendations that are made for precision act. So I'm going to kind of break down what I mean by our inability to map nutrient need. I mean, we all are doing grid sampling. We've all seen those maps. We're all getting variable rate recommendations from our consultants. But what's the basis? First, soil testing is four separate activities. Let's start talking by, let's start by talking about soil sampling. Then we're going to get into soil analysis. There's not much to say there. We actually do a pretty good job in the lab for old school accurate recommendations. I don't know about the future for Precision Act. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up by talking about how we interpret those results currently and how we should be interpreting them for Precision Act. So let's jump in and talk about soil sampling for Precision Act, what we're doing and what we should be doing. So when we're soil sampling for Precision Act, traditional soil sampling provides an average nutrient need. Precision Ag breaks a field down into smaller management zones. And we can do this through, as I said, grid sampling, or we can do it through uh, zone management. So let's talk about grid sampling. There's grid point and there's grid cell. I think grid point, in my experience, is more popular. It's easy. You can create a point map in your software. You go out to that point. You take a few cores at each point, put them in the bucket, mix them up, and each point gets one sample analyzed and returned uh, from the lab. And so this typically involves interpolation of those sample points, um, you know, and that's basically estimating what the value, soil test value is in between two known points. So I sample two points and I'm using interpolation to estimate the value in between. Um, when I look at 
Uh, grid point sampling, it's good at picking up areas where man-made management uh, decisions like an old tobacco patch or an old animal feedlot have altered soil nutrient levels uh, or where small fields were combined into a larger field. It does a good job of picking that up, but it doesn't necessarily characterize um, the natural variation that occurs in a field very well at the density that we currently soil sample. And we'll spend some time on that in a minute. The other option we have is directed sampling. Most people call it zone management, and that breaks the fields up into zones, and we collect an average sample from each zone. It requires that we have really good input data, perhaps yield maps, remote sense imagery, uh, EC maps from something like a varus where we've mapped the soil texture, um, even maybe grid data, but we're taking spatial data, we're looking at the relationship between that spatial data, and we're delineating zones, which we then go in and we sample to get an average soil test value for that zone. This is much more labor intensive. It requires each field to be delineated on an individual basis. It requires expertise with software and statistics, and we have to understand how those different input data layers impact nutrient need. Because of this complexity, we don't see zone management used very often or appropriately. Certainly the people that are trying it are the early adopters, and I talk to them quite often, and unfortunately we haven't provided, and by we I mean the academics, the researchers, really good ways to do zone management. Uh, hopefully we'll get better at that. Yeah. Grid point interpolation estimates unknown values between two known sample points. So in this simple graphic here, I've showed some grid point values, and that purple question mark indicates an unknown point in between, you know, most, there's four sample points close by. Interpolation uses statistics to estimate, you know, what is the value where that question mark is. And you can see here that we have one flyer, that 45 is much higher than the field average. And this is the problem with interpolation the way we currently do grid point sampling. There's a really great paper by Lausanne et al. that I really recommend um, everybody take a look at that's interested in this. It's, it's actually a pretty easy read for a scientific paper. And what they point out is that interpolation requires a correlation or R value greater than 0.3. So samples must be collected close enough to each other that they are correlated is, is what this means. And what they found is that we require a quarter acre grid or less to get an R value of 0.3 in most fields. Quarter acre. So at best, we're doing grid point sampling at one acre. The more common is a hectare of 2.5 acres. And so that one, acre, one quarter acre grid would be you know, cost prohibitive. So I'm not advocating that you do a quarter acre grid. What I'm saying is grid point doesn't work well for this reason. Unless your grid samples are on a quarter acre, your interpolated map isn't very good. Now, you can still use that data. You've still got a really intensive map of your field. It's just the interpolation is faulty. And then you say, well, but isn't it better than just taking, and taking 50 samples from a field, putting them in the same bucket, and getting an average value for the field? Unfortunately, no. So you may ask, isn't it better to do interpolate grid sample on two and a half acres than to just take 20 cores in a field, put them in a bucket, and get one number for the field? Unfortunately, no, that's not the case. And this is just pure math. It's, it's not a matter of kind of personal preference. Um, when you do interpolation and it's too coarse and your correlation value is not above 0.3, the field average is often closer to that true value of that unknown point than the interpolated value. And that's what Lausanne and others, and we've now done this work in Kentucky, have demonstrated is that when you do a one acre grid sample, the estimation produced by interpolation is further away from the true value than the field average. So you were actually better off just coming up with one average number for the field. And that's because at the small scale, soil properties tend to be stochastic. And so what does that mean? It means that they're random such that they can be predicted accurately, but not necessarily precisely. So on average, our predictions are good, but at each spot we're off a little bit and this inaccuracy or imprecision adds up across the whole field. So this is precision and accuracy. So when we're highly precise, our shots are grouped. What we would really like to be is precise and accurate. I don't have that shown here. What our nutrient recommendations are and what grid sampling is when we go uh, two cores is we have this low precision and high accuracy. And so on average, we're right, but at every spot, we're wrong. So what about zone sampling? And uh, what do we do with all the grid data that we generated? So 
Simple zone uh, from topography and texture is one option. And this tends to do a pretty good job at estimating kind of crop performance, but I'm not quite sure if it's going to trend with kind of nutrient response. It may be a good way to kind of group parts of the field that have similar nutrient characteristics together and similar crop performance together, but we're working on whether or not our recommendations hold up in this system. So what about doing a zone from topography and texture? That's probably one of the more common ways. It's one that we're experimenting with here in Kentucky and something that I think uh, is worth looking into. So a simple zone from topography and texture, you know, you can look at slope, aspect, elevation, um, maybe use texture coming from something like Veris, EC, maybe even NRCS data, although the Sargo data is a little bit coarse. And you can look at what are the nutrient response trends with that kind of lay of the land. Um, yield can be used to check zones, but not necessarily to make zones. I'm, I'm really not an advocate because if you're using yield, it actually has a very different relationship with nutrient requirement, right? Like higher yielding crops do remove more nutrients, but typically areas that are higher yielding require fewer nutrients. I'm going to show you some data on that this, to support that statement. Um, so I like to take and make my zones based on topography and soil type and then take a yield uh, zone map and compare the two and look at to see if it makes sense. But I don't use the yield to control uh, nutrient application because maybe a low yielding area is low yielding because it needs more nutrients. Maybe a high yielding area is high yielding because it already has a lot of nutrients. So using a crop removal equation where the high yielding areas get the most nutrient can often work against you and decrease you know, your opportunity to gain in those bad areas. And it would you know, cause economic loss in your good areas. So uh, you may already have grid data, many people do, and now you're transitioning to zone. What can you do with that grid point data that you already collected? I recommend checking out your summary statistics. So you can do a histogram. You can look at the median soil test value by zone. You can look at the quartiles. What's the range where most of the samples fell within that zone? So take your grid data and then clip it out by zone and look at these kind of summary statistics to say, how does this zone behave? How variable is this zone? Is it a highly variable zone or a pretty average where everything falls in line along the same number? Um, and so it tells you something about your zones. That grid data can help you to interpret your zones. Um, so I'm a big advocate of doing that, of uh, comparing that grid data to your zones. So we don't really have great guidance on how to do good zone management. I mean, we have some ideas, and we're currently conducting research, at least in Kentucky, to look at these things. Uh, but the truth is, is that we really need to put out more guidance in this area and help people. Uh, one software package I like mainly because it's free and the statistics are transparent is MZA, Management Zone Analyst put out by USDA ARS. It's available free to download from their website. Uh, great software package, but it's a little wonky because it was designed for old, uh, older versions of Windows. They've never really updated it, so it's a little clunky compared to software that you might be used to using. Nonetheless, we're currently working, we hope by the end of the year, to have some software tutorials up. So stay tuned on my Twitter feed for that. We're going to come up with some software tutorials that will walk you through using you know, freely available software since everyone's using something different. And if you learn to use it in the free software, you can then take those lessons and transfer it to your uh, commercial software package that you use on your farm. But we should have tutorials out by the end of the year. Uh, word of caution. We do not have soil test correlation and calibration numbers for zone management or grid point sampling. And I'm going to talk about this here in a second, but this becomes important. We can make the best zones in the world, but our recommendations were based on addressing the field average. And that's a bad way to go in precision management. So you're going to have to have a different set of recommendations for precision management. And unfortunately right now I think what most people do is take our old recommendations and shoehorn them into a precision setting. I don't think that's the way to go, and we're going to talk about that for the next minute or two. So if you're going to go down the zone management road, I would minimize the number of zones. Because we don't have uh, precision-based recommendations yet, you need to look for the big differences, right? Stick to the coarse knob, the big knob, and maybe have two zones or three zones. You know, We don't know enough to have eight different zones within a field in most cases. 
you're going to want to sample those zones intensively. While you're only getting one soil test number for that zone, you can put 50 cores in the bucket from that zone, mix them up really good, send them off in the lab. That's going to be the basis for a really good recommendation. And finally, establish on-farm trials, strip trials that you run across your zones to see if you hit the target rate right. So maybe you have two zones, three zones, take those three rates and set them up in strips that cross replicated times across the zones to test what rate is best for each of the zones. So I'm not going to talk much about soil analysis, um, but I do want to kind of just cover one little basic point. So soil testing um, is basically a way to provide an estimate of nutrient uh, intensity, so the quantity that's available, and what's stored in pools that will become available over the next year or two. So this quantity intensity relationship is at the heart of soil test-based recommendations. But multiple factors affect soil quantity intensity. So chemical factors, uh, biological factors, crop factors. And so soil testing can only provide an index of the nutrient supply capacity of the soil because that supply capacity, you have what's in the soil solution that the plant can access now. You have exchangeable nutrients that are constantly backfeeding what the crop removes. You have uh, organic matter that's mineralizing to provide nutrients. And then you have this kind of longer term storage. And so for every soil, it's kind of like an iceberg. You have this big quantity of nutrients that's not really visible in the soil test or visible to the plant. But if you take some of the nutrients off of that top part of the iceberg, it will float to the surface, float up to, to reveal more nutrients available to the plant. And so we're only, in most soil test systems, are a model-based system, and we're only using one data point in that model, one input, and that's soil test. And so maybe we should be thinking about what else we need. So let's talk about our interpretation and recommendations based on soil tests and how precise they really are. The first thing to understand is that soil test recommendations are based on correlation and calibration. So what's correlation? Correlation is at what point on the soil test scale can I stop fertilizing? So below the critical level, I need fertilizer. Above the critical level, I don't need fertilizer. The critical level doesn't tell us anything about rate. It just tells us where we can cut off at, right? And we usually cut off when most of the responsiveness hits about, you know, 95% response. What does that mean? Well, on the vertical axis, we have relative yield. Relative yield is the unfertilized yield divided by the fertilized yield. So if I got 50 bushels of corn without fertilizer and 100 with fertilizer, my relative yield is 0.5. So anything below, we use 95% typically, anything below 0.95 needs fertilizer. And that's how we establish that critical level through correlation. Calibration. Calibration gives us that rate. So we go out to a lot of different fields and we do a study where we put down different rates of whatever nutrient we're interested in, phosphorus, potassium, whatever, and we look at that yield. And maybe we look at relative yield. And an interesting thing to point out here is that this gives us that sufficiency rate. What rate maximizes yield? There are, are almost no recommendation systems that use a straight sufficiency because there's a lot of variability in this data. But also, it's important to point out that even on a very low soil test, I can maximize yield with fertilizer. I can live off of that fertilizer. So low soil test doesn't necessarily limit my yield. It just means I need more fertilizer inputs. So there is variability in correlation and calibration results. But again, our recommendations are, are accurate, right? Like on average, we're trying to give you the average amount you need uh, at that soil test across many fields. But if we're going to do precision ag, we need to look at some of this variability. This is also why our recommendations are probably higher than the sufficiency rate. Back in the day when these calibrations were performed, we went in and we kind of took and we said, what is the, the average amount that I need to maximize yield across dozens of fields? And then also we said, well, within that field, there's some variability. So we added a little extra on to account for that because some areas of the field need it more than others. And fertilizer is cheaper than yield. So that's why our recommendations are a little higher than they need to be, is to account for that variability in field or between fields. There are different philosophies for interpreting and making recommendations. So the first kind of approach is that sufficiency approach. When soil test level is below optimum, we're applying only enough to meet the crop needs. So that's sufficiency. Almost no one uses a straight sufficiency approach. But 
that sufficiency approach would just apply what is required. Unfortunately, a lot of this data has been lost over time because back in the day when we were establishing soil test recommendations, we didn't do a good job of retaining the information on what the actual straight sufficiency rate was for each of those soil test values. Build and maintain is another approach. So build and maintain says you never go to zero. You always at least apply crop removal, even if I'm not getting any yield response to that fertilizer. That's the maintenance part. And build is at that really low soil test level. We're saying we're going to apply a really high rate to rapidly get up to the critical level because we think we need to be at the critical level. So that's straight build and maintain. No one does straight build and maintain either. Almost all of us do some sort of hybrid approach. So these are corn phosphorus recommendations for uh, Kentucky. And you see we have a high rate down at the very low soil test to overcome that soil buffer capacity because very low soil test needs a lot of uh, phosphorus added to make it available to the crop. And then we kind of drop into a sufficiency range in, uh, in, in the middle area. And then we have a little bit of maintenance beyond our critical level. So we're recommending 30 pounds per acre of phosphate beyond what the soil test point where we think there would be no response. So when you look at commercial labs or university labs and the difference between different uh, recommendations, it's a philosophical difference. How much insurance did we add? How much build do we think we need? How far do we take that maintenance out past the critical level? That's really the difference. The correlation calibration data that goes in all these recommendations is likely from the same data set. It's just philosophical differences that change the recommendations between different people giving you those recommendations. So how should we be making precision recommendations? <clears throat> precision ag, I think, would require more frequent soil sampling. So not sampling every three to four years, but instead sampling every year or every other year. And we need to get closer to the sufficiency rates. Earlier I said we don't really know what the sufficiency rates are. But we need to go back, and there's an effort now nationally to do this, get all that historic data together, collect new data, and look at what is the yield maximizing rate. Sufficiency rates are likely less, well, we know they're less than building maintain rates, and they're probably less than even crop removal. So a 200 bushel corn crop probably removes about 60 pounds per acre of P205, right? And I'm guessing that sufficiency rates are, at, you know, somewhere below that 60 pounds per acre range, a lot lower than what most of our recommendation systems use. I think if you looked at actual data, you'd be surprised at how low some of the sufficiency rates actually are. Buffer capacity makes up the difference between what we fertilize and what uh, you know, the soil provides. And in precision ag, we're going to rely more heavily on that buffer capacity, and we're going to probably need a way to estimate that to get more precise recommendations. Here's a slide, uh, figure where I overlaid buffer capacity from some Kentucky soils on top of our recommendations for corn for phosphorus. And so build and maintain, a strict build and maintain would ignore this buffer capacity. And so that blue line shows some data that shows how much phosphorus fertilizer on the vertical axis at a given initial soil test on the horizontal axis would be required to move the soil test 10 pounds per acre in one year based on data by Tom and Dollarhide that was collected in Kentucky for multiple soils. And so what you see is that if soil test is less than uh, six uh, pounds per acre of phosphorus, or three parts per million, it would require 600 to 200 pounds per acre of phosphate, phosphate just to change the soil test 10 units. Soil doesn't pay interest and it takes many years to build very low soils. So actually, economically speaking, if you can maximize yield with 60 pounds per acre, what advantage is there to pour 600 pounds per acre on a field year after year after year to try and build up that soil test? You're not getting any more yield for all that investment. Take that extra money, the difference between, let's say, 60 is the sufficiency rate and 600 being the build rate. Let's take that 540 pound per acre of phosphate at 40 cents a pound and let's put it in an interest-bearing savings account because the soil is not going to pay interest and you'll get the same yield with just the sufficiency rate. So I would say that from a researcher standpoint, we need to work to come up with those sufficiency rates and provide them for people that want to be more precise. Again, you know, we're looking at, uh, at this soil as like this iceberg. And so that soil can supply a lot of nutrients, but we need to know where the soil can supply the nutrients. And that's going to be the next part of, of this presentation, improving precision phosphorus management.
So how have we historically done research? Typically it's you know five or seven phosphorus rates randomized in five replications or blocks we call them at four locations for three years, right? And we've done this forever. So we've got a 10 foot plot by 60 foot long and you know, five rates, uh, maybe five replications. There's 25 plots in that field. We do it for three years at three sites. And I see proposals from researchers all the time that say we need more data. I would argue that this is not right. We don't need more data. We need different data if we're going to do precision ag. Doing this kind of traditional calibration work is fine to reinforce our recommendations, to evaluate them, to see if they're right. But year after year, we come back and say, oh, our recommendations are still right because they are accurate. They, we did a good job historically. But if we want to do precision ag, I think we have to do something totally different. So what, how can we do research differently? Uh, the site-specific management research that we've been doing here for the past five or six years, we're trying to look at a spatial, spatially explicit correlation. What does that mean? Well, you see this image. Here's a field. Each one of those dots is a set of plots in the field. So each plot is split into four subplots. And in those, those four subplots, they're 10 foot long, wide by 40 foot long. We randomize in there, two of those four strips are going to get phosphorus and two don't. This is just correlation, no calibration. So it's a rate that we think is sufficient to cause a yield increase. And so we apply 60 pounds per acre of phosphate. We're using a four row planter. We're putting it down in the two by two. This is all no-till. And we've, this is uh, the sixth year at two sites. And we also have data uh, from friends in Texas and in Virginia who have worked with us to do similar layouts. And what we want to look at is just response. So we want to look at the difference in yield between the fertilized and unfertilized in those small plots. So these plots are 40 foot by 40 foot, so pretty small spot in the field. And what, how much yield do I get from adding fertilizer? And we target fields with very low soil test P. So we use ammonium polyphosphate in the two by two. We also have a tank of UAN. We're using uh, variable rate pumps, two pumps, so that we can keep nitrogen the same across the whole field. That's, if you're gonna do some on-farm research with phosphorus, make sure you're balancing the nitrogen so that you're not seeing a phosphorus and nitrogen response. Because nowadays it's really hard to put down phosphorus without nitrogen. So we're using ammonium polyphosphate, 1034-0 liquid fertilizer in the two by two, UAN in the two by two and we're keeping that starter nitrogen rate the same across the whole field. Okay, we're coming back, putting the rest of our nitrogen down at side dress. First thing we're gonna look at is early growth response. This year, I don't have that data crunched this year, the early growth response was amazing. At V6, the plots that got phosphorus, the plants that got phosphorus were twice as big as the plants on the next row over that didn't get phosphorus, right? And so, uh, we look at this and we see that we have all these points, so that's relative biomass, so that's unfertilized uh, plant their size in kilograms per hectare divided by fertilized plants so we've got relative biomass so uh, if if the number is is 50 percent or 0.5 that means the fertilized plant was twice as big that green line is at the 95 percent relative biomass that red line is University of Kentucky's uh, soil test level where our recommendations go to zero and so this is a pretty good indicator you want all those points to fall below the green line and to the left of the red line. And so we've done a pretty good job. When you're below our soil test critical level where we go to zero, not really critical level, but the point where we go to zero, um, you, you get a bigger plant if you fertilize. And this is at V4 to V6. So it's nice to have bigger plants at V4. What does it mean for yield? So this is average yield response across the whole field. So not by plot, but if we take all the plots that got fertilizer, phosphorus, and all the ones that didn't get phosphorus, how much yield did we get? And so this is from uh, two corn yield years at the sites, at two sites, and on average we had a statistically significant yield response to phosphorus. There was a lot of variability as that kind of bell curve shows, but on average we got nine, depending on year and crop, nine to 18 bushels per acre in three out of four site years. We also got a yield response in soybeans and wheat, even though we didn't fertilize them, we looked at residual carryover from the starter, that two by two band actually helped us get higher yields in wheat and uh, soybeans. And so we see a nine to 18 bushel per acre yield response on average across these fields in three out of four site years. But this is the kicker. On average soil test work, when we were below that critical level where we're, our re recommendations go to zero, and we applied phosphorus fertilizer, on average we got 9 to 18 bushel yield gain. But if I look at it on a plot by plot basis where I'm just comparing those 
two 10 foot by 40 strips with no phosphorus to the two with phosphorus, our soil test failed 50% of the time. Our, our recommendations are accurate. They are highly imprecise. On average, if I fertilized the whole field, it would have paid for itself. But in every single plot, the soil test was only as good as a coin flip in predicting which plot needed phosphorus. This is a little tricky to understand because of the map. Where plots responded to phosphorus, the response was big enough to carry the average compared to plots where there was no phosphorus required. So why do some of the plots with a soil test of five parts per million, or 10 pounds per acre of phosphorus, require phosphorus, and some plots down there at five parts per million don't require phosphorus? What's the difference? We haven't been able to figure that out yet. We do know that as we approach that, that cutoff limit that we see less variability in yield response, and we see a less potential for, um, for response. So, you know, we know that, that as soil test goes up, it's less likely that I'm going to need fertilizer, and I have a whole lot more variability down here at the low end. So what's causing that variability? If we're going to do precision ag, we have to understand and have an answer for that question. Where's this variability coming from at the low end? Now, some people think, okay, best areas of my field, seeing this, I'm going to put the higher rates on. But when I look, this is uh, four site years of data, uh, so two sites, two corn years, just looking at corn, and I'm looking at normalized delta yield. So delta yield is fertilized plot, yield, subtract unfertilized, divide it by unfertilized average yield for that plot. So that's what I mean by normalized. So, so, I could normal, so I could put all the data from different years on the same graph, right? So I divided it by that unfertilized yield. So the difference between plots divided by the unfertilized yield. And then I plotted that against that control yield, so the yield without fertilizer for that group of four subplots. And while there's a ton of scatter, if you look at the mean trend, the higher the yield, the less likely I was to have response. So that means the best areas of the field were less likely to need phosphorus fertilizer in these uh, four site years. And we see this across different studies. Uh, we evaluated organic matter we have evaluated microbial communities in the root zone. I am leaning towards, and I want to test this hypothesis, that soil physical properties may be largely responsible for this trend. That the highest yielding plots have really big roots and deep soil. In Kentucky, soil depth is very important. Because phosphorus moves, moves almost exclusively to the root through diffusion, and so only a quarter inch zone around the roots provides phosphorus to the plant, the bigger and longer your roots, the more phosphorus you can access from the soil. So when we have really good soil structure, no compaction, deep soil, these really good, healthy, well-structured soils, I get bigger roots, and so I have more feet of root for diffusion to occur across, I have higher yields, and I'm accessing more of the soil phosphorus, even when soil phosphorus test is very low. So we historically have focused on mapping soil phosphorus, grid sampling, uh, zone sampling, and all these. That's what we talk about in precision ag, how to do grid sampling. But that doesn't help us if that critical level is variable across the field. In other words, at this spot in the field below 30, you need fertilizer, and over there below 10, you need fertilizer. And it appears that that's what's happening. So if we want to be really good at precision ag, we need to not only be able to map soil tests, how much phosphorus is there, but we need to map a way, we need to map potential response. Um, I think that maybe if we could map potential rooting depth, we might be onto something. So we're gonna look into that. So we need new correlation and calibration data for site-specific management. We can't use our old correlation and calibration data. And as I said, the better areas of the field actually seem to be less responsive. So that's kind of our working hypothesis, but we need additional model inputs like rooting depth, soil depth, soil structure to be able to make these recommendations. We can no longer, you know, if we're gonna do precision ag, just having soil test phosphorus is not enough. So that's all I have for you today. Feel free to send me an email with any questions. Uh, check out my Twitter feed uh, at NPK underscore professor. Thank you.